Hi, in this video, we will look at chapter 16, rate of change. All right, so rate of change, we're talking about two variables, x and y usually, and as x changes, y also changes, uh, but they don't change randomly, okay? There is a pattern or there is a certain rate, and this rate is what we call rate of change, and we'll be exploring rate of change in this video. So here is an overview of what to expect in this chapter. We have five exercises and today we'll be focusing on 16a. Here we have three water bottles that have um, different shapes. The first bottle, it's a regular shape. It is cylindrical. So the, um, when we're pouring water at a constant speed, the water level will increase at a steady speed also. Okay, so because the shape is regular, it's a cylindrical shape, so if we pour water into this water bottle, then the water level will increase um, at a steady speed because the shape of the bottle is regular. What about in the second and third bottles? So we're not going too slow, we're not going too fast. So when the water is being um, poured constantly or steadily into this second bottle, the water level will increase faster as the bottle gets narrower. So as you can see here, for this part of the bottle, the water level will increase faster because it's narrower compared to the rest of the bottle. So similar to the second bottle, if we're pouring water into the third one at a constant speed, then the water level will increase faster as the bottle gets narrower. So it'll be this part right here. Pouring water steadily implies we are pouring the water at the same speed. We're not going too fast or too slow. So we're pouring at a constant speed. Okay, so let's have a look at the question here. It says water is being poured steadily into each of these vessels. Draw a graph that shows the relationship between the height of the water H and the volume that has been poured in. The following diagrams have V on the X axis. So this represents the volume of water that has been poured into the vessels. H is on the Y axis, which represents the height of water in the vessels. So let's look at the overall pattern for these four graphs. Clearly, as the volume in the vessels increase, uh, the water level also increase. And this makes sense because the more water you have in the vessels, the higher the water level is going to be. So generally, all four graphs are increasing. As you can see, when the shape of the vessels change, the relationship between the two variables V and H also change. This is because, um, so think back to the previous slide, when the shape of the vessel gets narrower, the volume increases faster. So in the first vessel here, we have a regular shape. So it's this um, rectangular um, rectangular shape vessel, so rectangular prism. And so as we're pouring water here, this corresponds to this section of the linear graph. So the volume is increasing according to this first linear function. Up until this point, the vessel gets narrower. So this pink part corresponds to this section of the graph. So first, as the volume increases, the water level also increases, okay, but quite slowly. But when it comes to this narrow part of the vessel, uh, as the volume increases, the height will increase much faster. And this bottom part of the vessel corresponds to this curve. You might be asking, why is the graph nonlinear? Why is it a curve, not a straight line? So if we compare the second vessel to the first vessel, the shape of this triangular part is also changing. So that's why it's not constant. It is not linear because the vessel is getting narrower all the time. And actually up until this point, so this green bit, it becomes a cylindrical shape again, which is a regular shape. So that means from this part onwards, okay, our graph becomes a straight line, a linear graph. And the water level is going to increase much faster because it's again, it's narrower compared to the bottom of the vessel. For vessel C, again, we have a curve first. The reason why our curve looks slightly different compared to um, the curving part B is because, so as you can see, this part contain more volume and 
again up until this point always as the volume increases the height will increase much faster since this shape is cylindrical it is regular so um, the graph becomes linear again okay and the water level is going to increase much faster as more water is being poured in so in part d we have a zigzaggy shaped vessel and if you look at the graph we have these wiggly lines so this means so this first section so this means the bottom part of our vessel okay it's much wider and it corresponds to this first curve which is increasing at a slower pace and as we move up the middle part of the vessel corresponds to the second curve so it's increasing slightly faster because it's um, it's narrower compared to the blue part as we move up again if i use orange okay so this curve corresponds to this little section here because again it's getting narrower okay up until this point we're going back to our regular cylindrical shape and which gives us this linear relation here and of course rate of change doesn't just exist in the previous example it is in fact everywhere around us so in this question we're observing the relationship between time in minutes and distance measured in meters right so a particle travels in a straight line the graph shows the distance d meters of the particle from a fixed point o over a period of 20 minutes describe the motion of the particle okay so i've labeled different points on the graph for you the first point, which is our starting point, um, is A, and then we have point B, point C, and point D. Notice that the graph starts at 0, 5. Now, since X represents the time and Y corresponds, so Y in this case represents the distance from the origin, and when time is equal to 0, Y is equal to 5. This describes point A, which is our starting point. And the starting point implies that uh, this particle is five meters away from the origin in the beginning. So this is because our graph is not starting from the origin. As you can say, our first point, our starting point is at 0, 0,5. So that means when time is zero, the distance d is equal to five meters. So the first uh, coordinate, we can write point a as 0, 0,5 and how to calculate the speed well the speed in this case is actually um, zero because that's our starting point we just started we haven't moved yet we also know that linear relationship is simply a straight line so the first segment a b it's a straight line and we can find the gradient okay how to find the gradient the gradient is equal to rise over run we need two ordered pairs two coordinates and in this case we'll just use the two endpoints a and b distance over time is actually equal to the speed so that's the whole idea behind the gradient in this case normally the gradient is equal to at the difference in y values over the difference in x values and in this case notice our y values represents the distance and x values represents time we also know that distance over time is equal to the speed all right so the gradient of the line a b is actually the speed of this particle so at time three maybe let's label the points first we already know a is 0, 5 and b is 3 comma 10 okay now we know the coordinates for a and b we can find the gradient of line a b so y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, 10 minus 5 over 3 minus 0. This is equal to 5 over 3 meters per minute. So this is the speed during the interval a, b. Because gradient measures the slope, the steepness of a linear function. And in this case, since we have a line that's parallel to the x-axis, this implies the gradient is 0. Also, we observe that every y value on segment BC equals 10. So this means the distance is not changing and therefore the speed is zero again. So we can say that at time at t equals seven, 
the distance from zero is still 10 meters because we, we haven't moved. All right, there's no change in distance, it's not moving. So the speed is simply zero meters per minute. This last row, we have a segment CD. Now the segment CD is a curve and it's going down. So this just implies the speed is decreasing. Okay, so we don't need to find the gradient in this case. Uh, so just notice that the line segment is a curve and it's going down so we can just conclude that um, this particle is, is decreasing in speed. Hope you find this summary table helpful. And now let's look at the standard solution in your textbook. So the solution says the particle is initially five meters from zero. That makes sense. That's our A point. It travels away from O for three minutes at a constant speed, five over three meters per minute. This refers to from our starting point A and to point B, which is when T is equal to three, the speed is equal to five over three. And since speed is equal to distance over time, okay, that means um, the gradient of line AB is five over three meters per minute. It then remains stationary at the distance of 10 meters from O for four minutes. And again, this matches with what we just talked about in the previous slide. So it remains stationary. It's not moving during BC. So the distance is still 10 meters from O and it stays there for four minutes. Okay, so from T equal to three to T is equal to seven. As you can see, there is no slope. There is no gradient. No gradient means there's no speed in this question. And if the speed is zero, it means that uh, the particle is simply not moving. Before returning to O at a speed which is gradually decreasing so that it comes to rest at O at time t is equal to 20 minutes. So again, like we said, it is gradually decreasing speed until it comes to D, which is the end point. All right, when time is equal to 20, that's when the particle um, comes to rest. All right, so I drew some pictures to help you understand this a little better. Um, so it's called Spidey on the Plane. As you can see, the left picture shows when x value is increasing, the y value also increases. And in this case, we say that the rate of change is positive. So as you can see, the spidey is climbing up the, the graph, okay? It's, it's getting higher. And on the right-hand side, we have when x value is decreasing, y value is getting greater, all right? So when spidey is climbing up the graph, the rate of change is positive. And when spidey is sliding down, the rate of change is negative. So hopefully this can help you to understand this a little better. And moving on, we have this one last example here. For the graph shown on the right, for x is an element of um, x is greater than or equal to negative 5 or less than or equal to 2, use interval notation to describe the set of values of x for which the rate of change of y with respect to x is negative, okay? So we want to find negative, and b, the rate of change of y with respect to x is positive. So as stated in the question, when x is equal to negative five, this is our minimum x value. And when x is equal to positive two, this is our maximum x value, all right? So this is our boundary for the domain. We also know that, so at this point has been labeled for us, negative three, two, this is our maximum turning point. And at the origin, we have our minimum turning point. And question A asks, um, where is the rate of change in negative? So negative means the spidey is sliding down. So here, the spidey will be sliding down the graph. So here we need to denote the x values only. So when x is equal to negative three, all the way to zero, during this time, um, the spidey is sliding down. So the rate of change is negative. So the rate of change of y with respect to x is negative for x is an element of negative three and zero. Notice we use curly brackets. We didn't use square brackets. So in other words, we're not including these two points as our end point. Why don't we include the two turning points as our end points? Well, the reason here is that turning points are not end points. At turning points, our graph still continues. It doesn't stop there. 
Whereas for the Tori end points, our graph clearly stops there. It doesn't go any further. So be very careful. Um, uh, make sure you use the right notation. So that's why we're using um, the curly brackets, not the square brackets. Now let's look at B. The rate of change of Y with respect to X is positive. Positive means our spidey is climbing up the curve. So it'll be so during this time and during this part as well. Now, since we have two parts and they are separated by another section of the graph, so we need to use the set notation. In this case, we use union because we are counting every parts of the graph where uh, the rate of change is positive. And also keep in mind that we have endpoints when x is equal to negative 5 and 2. So you need to use square brackets around these two values. And for all the other values, here we're concerned about turning points. So the set notation we need to use um, curly brackets because turning points are not endpoints. So that's all we have for 16a. And I hope you find this helpful and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.